So, Paul, CEO of Zero, have you, have you seen the new Star Wars movie? We can sit down. Let's sit down. Uh, of course. What, what, yeah, good. It was okay. Decent. It was awesome. <laughs> Uh, so I think a lot of people probably, if you haven't heard of Ciro, Ciro, they've made the B this BB-8 toy. Uh, not the BB-8 in the film, but, but this toy which basically brings BB-8 to life. Right. Everyone can have their very own droid in their home. And so, I mean, I remember, you know, the announcement last fall, there was so much excitement around this. But, you know, at TechCrunch, we're kind of assholes and we don't really care about what you've done before. The question is, what's next? What, what are you here, you know, showing off? What's new? So we're trying to take our... Uh, position is kind of leading this connected play revolution uh, to the next level. And today at CES, what we're doing is we're giving every Star Wars fan the power of the Force. They can become their own Jedi with the Force Band. Great. Let's, should we take a look? Uh, so we have expert demonstrator Jeff. Hi, Jeff. So what he's doing here is he's uh, commanding BB-8 with the force band using some gestures. So he's doing force pull and force push. Uh, he can do the, some Jedi mind tricks here in a little bit. And basically, whatever direction his body is facing, he can move BB-8 in that direction. So we can take the gestures from his body and translate it right to the droid. So tell me a little bit more about like what, what's actually happening under the hood there. So I mean, how is it that the droid can actually know well, what's going uh, on? The force works in mysterious ways. <laughs> okay. But uh, what's really happening is um, we're detecting all the motions in his body, and we're syncing those motions up to the um, sensors inside BB-8. So they're, they're completely aligned. So if he turns to the right, then BB-8 will turn to the right. If he turns to the left, BB-8 will turn to the left. Um, he can dance around, and, and BB-8 will follow him. There he goes. Wow. Woo! And avoid peril. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the force needs a little help. Uh, so, do you, are you guys saying anything in terms of pricing, availability? So, um, the force man will be available uh, in fall of 2016. Um, we aren't disclosing price other than saying that it will be, you know, uh, affordable so that everyone can kind of uh, bring their own Jedi experience to life. Um, and initially it will be sold in a bundle with a new battle-worn BB-8. So BB-8 here is pristine as if you just bought your own brand new astromech droid. The one in the movie's been used a little bit so we're gonna give you the opportunity to buy a new used BB-8. Great, so I'd love to talk a little bit more about kind of just how this partnership came about because you guys um, Ciro was not a company started to create BB-8 toys. You were a startup interested in robotics and, and education. How did, it, how did you end up you know, in this position in the first place? So, uh, Ciro was you know, already doing quite, quite successfully before we were introduced to um, Disney. We decided in 2014 to participate in another accelerator program. Uh, at the time, we already sold you know, over a half a million units. And when we got to Disney on the second day of the program, we had an opportunity, all the companies that were selected, to sit down one-on-one -on -one with the CEO of the Walt Disney Company, uh, Bob Iger. And in that meeting, he pulls out his iPhone and he starts showing us pictures from the new Star Wars set, The Force Awakens. And he says, you see that? That's the new droid. Uh, and he looks a lot like what you guys are making. Can you, can you turn him into a toy uh, that, you know, uses uh, uh, you know, your, an app-based experience. And of course we said yes, and the rest is history. So, wh wait, did, did, he, did you get the sense that he'd known going into the meeting that he might bring it up, or did, was it just he looked at it and that he immediately made that connection? Well, at the time, no one knew anything about Star Wars, right? It was under, it was in, very few people even within the Walt Disney Company knew the storyline or the new characters. So. We had no clue. We walked in and he's, we're like, we're looking at his phone and we're looking at the picture and we're going, I think we're looking at something pretty important here. And it took a while to process it. And that, after like a couple of minutes, we're like, you know, high five in each other saying, this is, this is an incredible, uh, incredible event. And when he asked if you could do it, um, did you say yes right away or was there a little bit of doubt and uncertainty? 
So we already had a mechanism to kind of put an accessory on top of Sphero. So technically we knew the mechanical engineering. Our only concern was is we didn't know if the movie was going to defy physics with CGI, like, you know, all of a sudden BB-8 is rolling in a way that isn't supposed to, or he flies, or, you know, has all kinds of crazy... Um, so then you'd have to say, it's like BB-8 in the movie, sort of, but when you do this, you can't, uh, you can't yeah. replicate this aspect but the, of it. But the beauty is, is the, the prop masters and J.J. Uh, Abrams, they wanted everything to be very practical effects, and so... BB-8 in the movie actually does follow real-world physics. I want to get back to that in just one second, but I should point out, by the way, that uh, your colleague there, he switched from a, a light band to, a white band to a, a dark band. Is, is that sort of an intentional? Are you going to have, like, white and black ones? Um, right now, what we're showing here, these are prototypes. The real units will look uh, completely different. Okay. Uh, they'll be very much in the Star Wars universe. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I, I imagine that you probably, you probably aren't, Disney isn't going to let you release exact sales numbers or anything like that. Can you say anything about sort of how, how, how it's done? So what I can say, um, I could talk about the company overall. Okay. Um, and so in 2015, we sold well over a million robots in 2015. And that's across all of our product lines. Um, and the emphasis is on over. Okay. And I, I mean, it's probably fair to say that, that this was the most popular of your Obviously, robot. this is the most popular. It came out September 4th, so we only had a few short months of sales, but it was a very aggressive um, month, few months. I think one of the people, the questions that people asked who, who knew about Sphero beforehand when, they, when the news came out was, you know, to what extent is this basically the Sphero device with a little thing on top, and to what extent is it a new device? So there's quite a bit going on differently inside BB-8 than in Sphero. It's, um, it has some mechanical differences, obviously, to allow for the mechanism uh, for the head. And it has a completely different set of um, firmware. Uh, that's the software inside the, the unit to, to give it its personality and to uh, deal with the mechanics of having this thing on top of a ball. And the, the cost, it, was, it cost like a little under $200, is that right? So in the U.S., they retail for $149. Okay. Um, they're selling on eBay for more than that, but uh, it, the, the retail price is $149. To what extent did you feel like this was something that went and got into the hands of, you know, sort of new Star Wars fans, kids, people who are maybe getting excited about robotics for the first time versus sort of the collector or the hardcore, you know, techie? So we, we actually have some really good numbers about that. Um, so prior to the movie launching, uh, about 70% of the buyers, of the users, uh, were male and uh, over the age of 25, right? So this is before the movie. Now that the movie is out, our demographic is 50-50, male and female, and virtually every age group is evenly represented up to the age of 50. So we're... It's, it's almost incredible to look at um, the segmentation. It's, it's such a, a well-received property across every demographic, that, um, and it's manifesting itself in, in BB-8. So, do, I mean, did you get the sense that it was people, like, they basically walked out of the movie and they said, oh, my God, like, that robot is so cool, I have to get it? Or, I mean, how, how, how is it that the movie made that kind of, you know, flip? Well, I think a lot of um, fans bought one for themselves and one for their child. <laughs> <laughs> and it then seems when, like a reasonable compromise. And then when Christmas came around, all the kids opened their presents, and then the, the, um, the demographics you know, started laying in, in, in line like that. Uh, I think what we're going to see is a huge pickup in 2016, because there's a whole new generation of kids that are just being exposed to the movie. Not everyone has seen the movie yet. Um, a lot of kids won't really fall in love with the character until they can watch it 30 times on DVD. So... Over kids are weird. Yeah, I know. It's just that's the way that's the way kids are. That's the way I was, um, and so we think that 2016 is going to be even bigger for Star Wars. And then, of course, with all the new movies and and um, material coming out, it's it, it's we're, it, it's the tip of the iceberg. So going back to sort of that initial process of creating, you know, the first BB-8. Um, how, I imagine it's not a process where they kind of were like, "Hey, just go make this." It was, they Disney, must, you must have had to sort of to put it sort of bluntly, jump through a lot of hoops within the larger company to, to make this happen? So, you know, working with a large company like Disney does have its hoops, but they're there for a reason, right? It's so you don't, we don't come up with 
uh, BB-8 that doesn't look like BB-8, or it does something that's inappropriate, like, you know, he's evil, but he's not evil. He's a good guy. So all of that's really important. So we, we welcomed it, but it, it was new for our company to, to work with, you know, to have that kind of oversight. Um, but the challenge for us is from the moment we saw the first image to the time we got the product on shelf, it was less than a year. And it was just a tremendous effort to like write all that software and get the technology just right. So your team didn't get a lot of sleep that year? They didn't get a lot of sleep. There was a couple of moments where uh, there were some, in, some intense uh, emotions flying around. But that's because everyone was so passionate about it. I mean, if I can't find an, a software developer or an engineer in the world or at least in our company that isn't in love with Star Wars, right? So everyone had this personal connection to the product, and when, you're, when you have that kind of emotion tied up in the development of something, uh, it, it comes through in the quality of the product, but it also comes th through in, in some of the um, feelings that people may have. Was there any concern, I mean, you know, I, I think probably by that point, or I mean, at any point, it was probably a safe bet this was going to be a successful film. But I think, at least for me, it's been surprising, A, I mean, the, the degree of the success, and then also how excited people are specifically about BB-8. Um, was there any worry that, like, oh, maybe we're sort of like, yeah, like, it'll be a successful movie, but no one's really going to care about the robot, and it's kind of going to be, you know, not going where we want it to go? Well, the good news is, is uh, Disney is pretty, um, pretty good at this, right? So <laughs> when they look at you and say, this is it, uh, you kind of believe them, and uh, you, back, you, you back up all your resources to make sure that you deliver because you know it's such a mega property. I, I'm sure there's levels of success of this movie that they hoped for but didn't necessarily count on, and uh, they're now pleasantly surprised because it's shattering all records. And, um, and of course, we broke new ground with the Sphero BB-8, right? It was a, a, it, it's a high price point toy, app-enabled toy, piece of technology that's selling at levels of inexpensive ones, right? So we're seeing tremendous volumes that ha has yet to be seen of a product in this category, which just, which just tells you that the world is ready for tech-enabled, connected play experiences, right? And that's kind of the foundation of our business, and this is a great manifestation of it. So talk a little more about how, where did the idea for the, the force band come from? So we've always had this idea. Um, so some of our core technology inside the robot is on this um, using the sensors to give a very precise sense of direction, right? Because we're moving a ball, right? So there's no front. And so if we want to go straight, turn around, and come back, we have to be really good about knowing which direction it's heading. And you can't rely on compasses, and you can't rely on GPS. So you have to be really good at using the core sensor stack. And we said, what if we had two of them, one on the body and one on the robot, and we could sync them, we could just use gestures. And so we had this, but we needed a context to bring that, that, that play pattern to life. And of course, the force is the perfect example, right? You know, you, 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 we've seen in all the movies, they just do this and something magic happens in the real world. So it was a, it was a natural extension, but we were always kind of in the back of our minds thinking about this essentially universal physical remote, right? Let's move everything in the physical world with just a gesture. Right, and I mean, I think most people know this, but to say explicitly that with the existing, the available BB-8, it's, it's controlled by with an iPhone app right now, or a smartphone app, and so this, that's sort of what you're replacing, essentially. So, yeah, you, can, you don't need a phone to actually use the Force Band. You can connect directly to your BB-8 and start, start commanding him with the Force Band. Um, there will be a companion app on the phone uh, for training purposes and maybe some other things that you can do. But uh, right now, uh, the idea is, is, yeah, you could just, you can, you can go out into the real world with just your force band and your BB-8 and command it, and, and all the sounds will come out of the band as well. So I, I think we're almost out of time. I'm going to ask a few more questions, uh, quick questions. Sure. One is, are you going to see episode eight before we do? You know, uh, probably the, the short answer is no. I got invited f four hours one day before to see the movie, uh, and so no, I won't see it. And matter of fact, we knew very little about the story going into um, 
going into the holiday season. So basically, what happened is Disney gave you sort of these assets, sort of these sort of guidance of like this is. I mean, this was like this is sort of the guidelines of how it should behave. But we're not going to sit you down and like let you watch. The yeah, and because frankly, many people it, within Lucas didn't know it. Right? It's not it, the story wasn't wild, wildly known. Right? This is uh, that's one of the great mysteries behind Star Wars. They keep you in it, anticipating it, and they won't tell anyone. Is it safe to say that BB-8 will be in Episode Eight? Uh, well, he was alive at the end of the movie, so I s suspect he will still be alive and functioning properly in the next movie. And uh, no one told us has told us to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, Paul. Thanks so much for joining us, um, and congratulations thus far. And um, no, I mean everyone at the TechCrunch New York office loves their BB-8, so I think it's great. Yeah, we love them too. Thank you so much.